Our engagement, it's bad dope letting the public in on the know. Why? Well, we have to make it look as though you're still doing a solo act. It's better publicity. Can't you ever get publicity off your mind? After all, this doesn't mean anything to me unless you and We're I... We're in no rush, sweet. I don't mean anything to anybody. And after all, you've got to get around to... However, Billy wasn't quite done with movies yet. He still wanted to work and show that he could still carry a film. His agent found him two film roles at Mascot Pictures, a Poverty Row studio that produced B-movies. The first was Young and Beautiful in 1934, which saw Billy playing Robert Preston. Not that Robert Preston. A press agent trying to get his actress girlfriend a shot at stardom. Take a look at the scene. Tell me, Bob, is it true? Is what true? A little bird in the studio restaurant this afternoon happened to see a rising young star, Jill, her handsome young lover. Let's not talk about that. Oh, don't be so downhearted. I know a girl who would appreciate some good publicity. Oh, it's publicity you want, huh? <laughs> well, I can give you a plenty. I can do anything with a headline. I can even break your heart. Billy played the part convincingly, but there was still that hint of disillusionment and sadness, albeit with a subtle sense of fight, left in him. The New York Times and Variety were kind and praised the film being better than they expected, coming from a Poverty Row studio. Billy's final film was 1934's The Marines Are Coming, which co-starred Esther Ralston and Conrad Nagel, two other silent Gotalki stars that were also losing their popularity at the time. It also took him back to playing a Marine for the first time since his big, big hit, Tell It With Marines, in 1926. The film was not well-reviewed and was far from a hit, but I still like it, and I think that it still shows Billy at his best, delivering strong emotional lines with so many subtle emotions hinted by his face and physicality. Take a look at both of these scenes. But I thought that was all over. It is all over, Dorothy. Of course, your private life is no concern of mine, Bill. I have no private life except you. Can you think of any reason why I should believe that? The best reason in the world, because I love you. She is beautiful. I don't blame you. What's the matter? Jealous? And why should I be jealous? The same reason I'm jealous of Ned Benton. You love me, Dorothy, the same as I love you. What's the use of sidestepping? We love each other. But that girl... Oh, all of my life, long ago, ever since I met you. Oh, I must think. Don't. I can give your life something. Far places that leave pictures in your soul forever. Sounds that would ring like bells in your heart. Please, Places please. of long ago and far away. I could paint your life bright gold. What are you saying? You thought I was with those guys, didn't you? Yeah, I did for a minute. A good old Santa Fe, Dallas. You're just as dumb as you ever were. That was meant for me, you hurt? Yeah, but I don't know how bad it is. The prisoners are like trying to escape. Attack the stronghold. No oh, hold. Let's go ahead and go right here. As you saw, Billy still even had some heroic fight left within him and saves the day. But by 1935, Billy had had enough of the film industry and discovered his life's new passion, interior design. Remember his set decorating for Just a Gigolo? Well, Billy had an innate talent for it and decided to keep going with it. He first redid the interiors of friend Carol Lombard's home and then the homes of Claudette Colbert, William Powell, and of course, Joan Crawford. His style was fascinating and influenced by Art Deco. He became more and more respected as a designer and eventually founded William Haynes Designs, a firm still in operation today. Believe it or not, later on he even designed and redid the home of Ronald and Nancy Reagan and became close friends with them. Check out this wonderful book. Class Act by Peter Schifando and Jean H. Matheson. It features beautiful fo photos of Billy's designs and fascinating essays about his style. Aside from a scandal that saw Billy and Jimmy wrongfully accused, I'm not going to address that here, Billy and Jimmy lived out the rest of their lives in happiness as husband and husband. Joan Crawford called them the happiest married couple in Hollywood. Billy died in 1973 at the age of 73 from lung cancer, and Jimmy died a year later. They are buried side by side in Santa Monica so that they can remain together for eternity. So, we are left with the question, why did Billy's talkie stardom not stick? Well, first of all, we have Billy's homosexuality. It could be that the more conservative public began to suspect that he was gay and that that lost in popularity. But the more accurate conclusion is that Billy refused to play the game and pass as a straight man. He refused to be anyone that he was not. In a moment of weakness, he almost did, but through the help of his friend Anita Page, he found the courage to keep being himself and stay with the love of his life. 
While I don't think the increased knowledge of Billy's sexuality necessarily helped his career, I don't think it hurt it as much either. What hurt it was his defiance of Mayer, which is what led the studio to start hand handing Billy scripts of lesser quality in 1932. The same thing happened to Jack Gilbert, who was straight. However, it could also be that Billy's type of wise wisecracking braggart role was not as easily loved on the talking screen as it was on the silent screen. I also really disagree with this. That was maybe the case, but Billy showed that he was more than easily adaptable across style and screen personas. He easily begun playing different types of talkie roles well and was critically claimed while doing so. Whatever the reason was, Billy moved on to a career about which he was far more passionate and left behind a legacy of several amazing films that continue to delight audiences to this day, like me. Also, his legacy as a courageous defender of his sexuality and firm stance on normalizing homosexuality in society has caused him to be seen as a hero in many people's eyes, mine among them. Thank you, Billy, for everything. Join me later this week as I investigate the silent the talkie career of the beautiful Agnes Ayers. She was at the height of her fame in the early 20s and was even the larger star when she appeared with Valentino in his big break, The Chic. But by the early 30s, her career was more or less washed up. Join me to find out what happened. Thank you so much for joining me again. I'm Charlie, and good night.